Welcome to the San Mateo Arboretum Society's monthly Zoom seminar, Mid-Year Rose Care. It will last approximately 60 to 90 minutes and be recorded. Following the presentation will be a question and answer session. Submit questions during the presentation by clicking on the chat box icon. A few days after the presentation, you will be emailed a link to the recording and to an evaluation form to provide feedback. Before we start, a little information about what is happening at the Arboretum Society. Our nursery in San Mateo Central Park is open Saturdays and Sundays, 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Enter the North Gate. Payment is by credit or debit card and Apple or Google Pay. No cash is accepted. While you're in Central Park, visit the Rose Garden, Butterfly Hummingbird, and our Sun and Shade Demonstration Gardens. All are maintained by the Arboretum Society's volunteers. Today's presenter is Stu Dalton, Master Rosarian and Master Gardener. Stu is a Peninsula Rose Society past president and current vice president, a University of California Master Gardener and American Rose Society Master Rosarian. He grows over 250 roses in his Menlo Park garden and has given numerous talks at the Arboretum Society and elsewhere. Welcome, Stu. Thank you all. And, uh, thanks for being here in person and on Zoom. Uh, I'm uh, glad to be here today. Such a gorgeous day. Seems a shame to be inside the closed room. On the other hand, afterwards, we're going to take a, a stroll through the outside, and take a look at what's going on in the garden. I will say that the garden looks pretty good. I was thinking maybe I should point out a lot of the problems, but there aren't a lot of problems that they've taken great care here and the volunteers should be commended on that the status of the rose garden. Uh, today, we're gonna to talk about uh, the uh, mid-year rose care. Now, what's mid-year? Uh, right now, I'm gonna focus on some of the things you do after the first bloom, and for things that are once blooming, you do the pruning at this time of the year. So we'll talk about that as well. And I'm gonna focus a little bit extra on drought and water, since we're all, focused on that these days. You even had a question before uh, we started about deep watering, and I'll go into that a little bit, and some of the science that uh, the UC Davis has developed around water and roses. There is some new research that's been done on that. Uh, plus, there's the folklore of how to do it, and uh, the art of how to do it, and we'll talk about that as well. So if we could uh, get the slides. Uh, We'll have the uh, slides for the uh, uh, presentation come up. I've been rose gardening for, well, let's see, over 50 years now. And uh, started with my first house over in the East Bay. For the last now um, 33 years, I've been in Menlo Park. And uh, I'm just at the southern end of the area of uh, Menlo Park near Palo Alto. That's what's called zone 9C, 9B in the, uh, in the uh, USDA. And it's zone 15 for anyone that uses the Sunset Western Garden book. I'm about a block and a half away from the old Sunset Garden gardens. So I know that zone very well. And uh, Anyway, the slides here illustrate a couple of uh, things, including my favorite rose, which is the same as this rose, which I just cut out on the harbor there, Sally Holmes. There's a bouquet out of here, which doesn't, you don't have to have many of those sprays to be the, uh, uh, the type of spray that you can put in a, a nice little vase to show off. And one of the things I'm gonna talk about is minimal or no sprays. Uh, I was mentioning before we started that I created a bee watering station. They're always looking for water. And if they get into a puddle, they can drown. So this is perfect. They, they have little holes in, in the thing that bottom waters pots. And the, the bee thinks this is their watering hole, literally. Uh, and they, they go in and I saw eight of them lined up in these different holes mm -hmm. yesterday uh, as an example. Next slide. Uh, 
right now, the big things are what's called deadheading or summer pruning, water and mulch. And the water and mulch do a couple of things for you, including soil health and water use. The idea with deadheading, we were again having a little conversation before we started. Literally, all you have to do is cut off the blooms. And there was a question why well, cut off these individually on a floor abunda or down below? And you cut off down below. The other comment was you do it lightly. You want a lot of branching structure on something that's called floribunda. Floribunda, flower abundance. So they bloom a lot. Uh, and they have lots and lots of blooms. Hybrid teas, like in the, uh, this one, that happens to be Pink Promise. And you can see it has a long stem, the kind of thing that they use for florist roses. This uh, was actually being deadheaded. And I use this as an example for two reasons. One is three, 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 five. You go down typically to a five leaf set. That's typical. I hate to say how many times I just go and take it off. And that, that works. That works, but if you just take it off anywhere, uh, I don't know if we can switch to the uh, camera, the upper one. I'll uh, try and show this. Uh, that one, okay. Uh, if you look, can you see it straight on? No. Yeah, it's, it's over there. And, you can sort of see this if I show it straight on. It looks like there's three different leaf sets going in different directions. Stop Where? The share. Huh? I'll stop the share. Good. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, there are three different ones going in three different directions. How do I want the plant to grow? You tell it where to grow or where to go, depending <laughs> on if it's sticking with the form. Uh, but seriously, if you if you want it to grow in this direction. This was a five leaf set. This is a five leaf set, actually uh, seven. And this is a uh, five leaf set. So any of these would work to cut it above. If I wanted to grow this way, I'd cut above this one at an angle. And that way it heals over nicely. And the thing below each leaf set looks like a nose and a smile. That's the bud eye, dormant bud eye. And uh, the leaf scar, those, that's what those are. The bud eye will, uh, if you cut above it, it'll grow in that direction. So that's, you're telling the plant how to grow and how to shape. And uh, so that's, that's an important point. Okay. Uh, I'm going back and forth, and we're doing the multimedia here. So bear with us. Uh, this has been great. Uh, you're shaping the plant. Uh, if you, or like me, you have some once bloomers, for instance, some around the area have seen these enormous, either white or light yellow, early spring blooming lady banks ropes. They grow huge. And uh, what do you do with those? Well, if there are lady banks rows, you uh, have to either keep it in, in check or have something that it can grow up into as they grow enormous. I have several of them, and I don't want them to grow up into the trees. So I take a hedge trim to them. And I do it at this time of the year, because after they bloom is when they start to have rapid growth. And so I, uh, there was one that I uh, cut off a couple of days ago, and it had grown probably five feet in about a month and a half. So they really put out these long things that you can sort of trim it to shape it any way you want. So you can get by the pathway or whatever. So tell it what to do. Uh, that's, I'll, I'll talk a little more about that. Uh, and then we had a discussion about watering and watering deeply and infrequently. All of us have had water issues. Last year, we had water issues. I kept my water use 30%. My lawn looks like that. Uh, this year it looks even worse, uh, but uh, uh, I saved 30% last year and another uh, percentage this year by not watering the lawn except deeply, cutting it high and doing something called grass cycling. And it doesn't really survive very well. 
But when the rains come back, it comes back. That's all I'm doing with the lawn. And I minimize lawns, do other things. But for roses, I was sort of illustrating this. Well, uh, when I do uh, switch to the top camera, I'm going to go to the camera. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll illustrate it with my hands because we were doing this uh, before the meeting. Say that this is a, uh, a bud union, roots, and the rose. Can you see that? Yeah. Uh, here's the, uh, the rose up here. Well, down below, what's happening? There's a sort of a vase shaped water column underneath. If you just watered right near the uh, plant, it will go down and it sort of spreads out, and then it, there's a little bit that goes even deeper. If you want the roots to go deep for water, you have to uh, train it. If you train it to go near the top for water, you're going to use more water. And you're going to you're not going to be able to get by on what I uh, uh, talk about. Okay, if you can go back, I, this is I, this is really an exercise for uh, uh, Kevin here. We're going to double the tail again. Oh, you're going to double the tail. Oh well. For this session? <laughs> okay, I'm sorry about that. Oh, no. Yeah. Okay. Um, the uh, pruning equipment. And of course, let me go through this first, and I'll use the pointer for the people out there. And this shows, uh, I'm probably going to be in the way here. Uh, it, one of the things I added more recently is something I use, which is a battery operated, heavy duty pruner. And it's a hedge trimmer. And I only prune my Sally homes. I have 15 Sally homes. I only prune those with hedge trimmers because it would take far too long if I didn't. And they will sprout everywhere. They don't tend to get uh, die back. They're amazing. Many other roses do pretty well with uh, uh, hedge trimmer quick dead heading. And then I'll go back and, and clean up a little bit on the ones that uh, require. That's the thing I've added on this. The other thing I've shown on this is uh, oh, sorry. Uh, sharpening tools. I can show this in a minute on the, the, the lower camera uh, and how to do it. But I can tell you right now, the way to test it is what I did for the a meeting. If it's sharp enough to cut a piece of paper, it's sharp enough. I used to illustrate it by a technique I do not recommend, which is I shave tear off my arm to like myself, and I stopped that procedure. Uh, the, the, the thing is, you do need to protect yourself from thorns and everything. You need sharp bypass shears. Bypass meaning the blade goes by the other. There are also other kinds of things that are out there. This one's for bonsai minis, et cetera. And it's like a scissors. There are two sharp blades on this one. The bypass has one sharp blade, the one that I've shown as sharpening, and then one that's uh, sort of angled, but it's uh, all you need to do on that is remove burrs. That's the way I find to do that. Uh, uh, there are several brands of this, but it's a silicon carbide sharpener. The way I uh, this is my 20 year old Elko printer. Uh, hold it with the blade, uh, the blade end to, towards your arm and the, and the handles facing out. Open it up, put the bevel down, pretty much like uh, this. And what I'm doing in person here is, is just uh, it's going to be hard to see for anybody else, but I'm pulling the uh, carbide over the blade at about the angle of the bevel. So that makes it very sharp. I do that before every pruning. Helps my arthritic hands, helps the rows have a nice clean cut, which you don't want to use. And I keep this just for this purpose, is called an anvil pruner. An anvil pruner isn't even on the picture here because it has a flat bottom and a uh, double-sided sharp knife. And when you try and use it to cut something like this, it's, not, it's crushing, it's not 
really doing what it's supposed to, which is make a nice clean cut. It will cut it, but it crushes it in the process. That's my illustration, and no, it hasn't been sharpened. <laughs> uh, the, uh, you want to protect yourself. Probably the most important thing. Uh, three things, especially if you have climbers. A hat. You can use any kind of goggles or glasses, uh, dark glasses, uh, reading glasses, whatever you have, or goggles. And the reason for that is very simple. I'm pruning a climber and it comes up and bites you, which they've done for me. I had uh, marks above. And one of our members uh, had a great picture of a huge swelling and, and bruising and uh, damage. So uh, if it comes up and hits this with the glasses, you uh, get some protection with the brim, with the hat, you get some protection. So there's protect yourself that way. A couple of kinds of gloves that uh, are typical. The gauntlet glove is a great glove. The uh, type of leather that is more thorn penetrant resistant is goatskin. Uh, now, you can't always find the right thing. This is heavy rawhide on the back. So it's very soft goatskin on the uh, flexible on the, uh, the hand. There are different manufacturers. This one is a manufacturer that makes chainsaws. So it's pretty protected. Uh, so you protect yourself. Normally, when I'm pruning, I try and wear a long sleeve shirt unless it's horribly hot. Uh, because, you know, normally I have scars, um, like many people do that play with roses. But I forget, I go out there and I do something and I'll shoot. Okay, so yeah, next slide. Yeah. I guess I could have done that. Sorry. Uh, and pretty most roses, we talked about this a little bit, but uh, you want to get ahead the spent blooms. And what that does is it causes reblooming in about six to eight weeks. Uh, you, you remove the dead or damaged growth. That's probably obvious. You know, any dieback or uh, problems or wind damage that you need to remove. Uh, and I talked about where you pruned above the leaf set. And you can see it right there. Here was a three leaf set. Here was a five leaf set and cut there. Uh, and you can see the angle that I used, about a 45 degree. It doesn't have to be exact. Cut it straight across, it'll still work. Next slide. Now, you can reduce the disease without sprays by summer pruning. Summer pruning is uh, very helpful. And one of the ways you can think of it is let in the air and light reduce the fungal disease. If you think about mold and mildew and things around the house, air and light is one of the things that prevents them. Sunlight literally uh, kills some of the uh, spores and such, and certainly bacteria and other things. And if you cut out canes growing to the center, sort of the, in this illustration, the red line, uh, the, it, it, this is over, illustration just to, that I can draw. But the idea is to let the air and light in the middle. And it's the same thing you do with fruit trees when you prune. Uh, like uh, there's something that the master gardeners call a sun cut to give you more uh, entry of light into the middle. That's how you prune an apricot tree for instance. And uh, if you can see that there's a uh, area down at the bottom here, that I'm saying six, eight to 12 inches, cut the bottom leaf growth from the eight to uh, 12 inches at the bottom, and it prevents flashback of spores and allows air circulation to go through the middle. And this reduces the overall fungal disease that you're gonna find in roses. Uh, next slide. We talked about this a little bit. Uh, the old roses, many of them, the ones that uh, were before the hybrid tea, many of them bloom once, not all. Some bloom more often. Uh, the, uh, they bloomed once and they bloom for a long time often. Things like the 
Lady Banks Rose are the ones that you see all over in the area. There are some others that are once bloomers. But they, if you uh, prune them, uh, if you prune them in the winter, you're going to cut off a lot of the bloom because they tend to bloom on one to two year wood. And so what you really do with those is you shape them. Cut out anything that's dead, cut out anything that's crossing and disease that you don't want, but don't over prune uh, at this time of year, or uh, you just shape them. If, they, if you need to keep them in bounds, like it's a area too near your walkway, uh, prune it heavily, but realize that you don't want to prune them again in December or January or February, like you might many of the other roses. Uh, remove the dead damage disease growth, that's for everything. Go ahead. Yeah. Remove suckers. We're going to walk around in the garden a little bit. Uh, and uh, these aren't the, the best uh, photographic illustrations, but they, uh, this is a picture I took in May of uh, a couple of years ago in the San Jose Rose Garden. Now uh, on the left, the uh, red is the sucker. It has taken over. There is a little bit of pink over on the uh, very right side here. There's the pink, here's the red, and it really dominates. And this is in a well-kept poster. Uh, I, I, I help uh, with the Scololi, I give talks to the docents on in the Rose Garden, and I can always find suckers there. I can find them in my yard. Uh, they're, they're really hard to deal with because it's a very, very vigorous rootstock that they use when they bud on the desired rose. Some hybrid teas don't do all that well on their own roots. It's also a lot cheaper and a lot faster to propagate roses by budding than it is uh, bud grafting than it is by doing just a cutting. There are reasons for that that I won't put into today, but suffice it to say that uh, you can get all sorts of things, including lots of suckers from what's normally Dr. Hewitt. That's probably a Dr. Hewitt. That's the rose variety that is incredibly vigorous and puts out lots of suckers as well. Uh, not yet. Uh, you want to remove them completely, and we'll illustrate that out in the garden, but I want to talk about it here. Uh, the, there's a, 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 hard to see probably, the, there's a sucker. It's not coming out of the, this is a, a, a tree rose or a standard. And this is coming out, and this is coming out from below at the root. And those are suckers. You can usually tell because they don't have a lot of thorns. They are long and stringy. The leaves may look like a different color. And if they ever do bloom, they'll be bright red, one time bloom, and then they're done. Now that's Dr. Hugh. And a lot of the California uh, growers and some other growers use Dr. Huey as the root stuff. There are others, but that one's very common. Uh, so to remove them, you try to work your uh, clear away as much as you can of the soil down to the root. Root should be a couple inches deep uh, that might be putting out this sucker. Try and work it back and forth and take all that material off if you can by working back and forth. If you can, try and get it flush to the root with a, a shears. And if you can't, you just cut it off of the ground and it'll come back. They're very good about coming back. It seems like a couple of weeks, there's another one, but two people are whatever. Uh, okay, so remove them completely or as completely as you can. Next slide. Uh, insects, mites and uh, other critters and other issues. This I'm bringing for one of the first times I've used it in public. I bought it just a couple of months ago. It's a brand new little thing that's a great little thing to have in your back pocket if you have pockets. It opens up and this happens to be soft lives. This one is beneficials, aphid eating lady beetles, ladybugs. The leaf hoppers, tree worms, armored scales, gall mites, 
all these different things are illustrated and then down at the bottom, how do you deal with them? And the back has information. So it's a really consolidated thing. They're a little pricey. Uh, I don't get any uh, money out of this, but uh, UC puts them out, I think they're 25 bucks a piece. There are several different ones on weed identification and other things, uh, veggie uh, pests. But this one has you know, gall markers, it has oak root fungus, it has rust diseases, which a lot of people have. Uh, it's, it's very handy. You can take a look at them afterwards. But they're at the UC Agricultural Natural Resources, and there should be in publications for that. Uh, so uh, the, the thing you do when you walk the garden, and I didn't see any pests out here that were uh, really problematic. You check as you walk the garden. If you possibly can, ID the pests. And something like that may help. There is also a, um, a card that I couldn't find before I got here. Uh, that's a, a, called Good Bugs, Bad Bugs. That is uh, available from the Mac Garden Guide or Mac Guides. They, they have laminated things you can pick out in the garden. But uh, you can also find them by uh, bringing the sample in an enclosed uh, uh, thing to the master gardener's uh, help line here or help table here, uh, or send a, a quick photo of them into the master gardener's help line, or for that matter, the Peninsula Rose Society. Check the plants as you walk the garden, and I need the pests if possible. There's excellent information available on uh, insect and uh, mite ID. Uh, and there's a specific thing on that in the, uh, the, the link here, but you can get that later when you, or you can just go on UCANR Rose Pests. You'll find uh, the links on that. I almost never spray uh, broadly. Sometimes I spot spray and I use for uh, critters, I use neem, and I'll talk about that in a minute, uh, when I have to, and uh, I'll tell you why. And spinosad, which is newer, and it's also derived from a soil, bacteri uh, a soil bacteria that uh, it's not as harmful. In fact, it says it's usable for organic produce, so is neem. Uh, and then I use integrated pest management, get the good ones. There are things like growing alyssum that attracts parasitic wasps that go after the pests on the uh, roses. And if you ever plant alyssum, you can't get rid of it anyway. So, <laughs> well, at least I can. Uh, plus, I really read for it. But there are other things that uh, uh, anything that attracts the pollinators is probably going to be helpful to have uh, in the garden to help reduce pests. Uh, next slide. Fungal diseases. Usually I can bring nice examples. Uh, I didn't find anything in my yard and there's not much out here either. Uh, there was one that someone brought into the plant clinic a few minutes ago. And it was a type of fungal disease that causes small black spots, but not big black spots, which is a separate fungal disease that I will show here. And the other thing that's very common in our area, almost all the time, uh, all the time, and especially seems to be in my yard in the fall, is rust. And it literally looks like little piles of rust on the bottom of the leaf at this time of year. Later in the fall, it turns black. So you'll still see the piles, but they'll turn black. That's rust. And uh, there's a clean thumbnail to give the indication of what it should look uh, like. The uh, mildew. That's a real severe case, but uh, that's something you can, uh, I'll talk about in a minute, but uh, I've recently found some research from the UC that uh, talks about eradicating mildew with something that is very literally non-toxic. I'll show you a packet of it that I bought on Amazon as a nutritional supplement. And uh, in a minute, next, if you spray, all, you know, wear these goggles, wear long sleeve shirts, wash up afterwards, even if it's a non-toxic, 
You just don't want any of that stuff on you. Uh, though I will say there's some pretty non toxic things in there. Read and follow the label. Check and see what it uh, says and how to mix it or not with anything. Uh, always try and spray early in the day on a day that's dry, not windy for 24 hours. Uh, and then spray oil spreaders and stickers. Stickers are where it literally sticks to the uh, leaf using things like surfactants, detergent, or oils are a good example of spreaders and stickers. But you don't want those spoils and soaps, so they're non toxic, but you don't want them on the leaf unless you want it to look like this. This probably is not a spray burn, but it looks a lot like a spray burn. But the reason I say that is the leaf end tip is where the spray goes, rolls down and concentrates, and then it reduces the amount of transpiration from the leaf, and then the heat, it burns. So that's what spray burn does typically. Uh, you spray the underside of the leaves as well, especially important for fungal diseases. Spray the ground around the plant lightly if it has motion such on top. You don't want to hit the soil like heavily. Uh, I use a very small sprayer most of the time. I don't even use a one gallon. And I've got 250 roses because I've spot sprayed. I will go after the ones that I want to. Next slide, I think, is the one that yeah, yeah, here we go. Two things here. One is something that I went into the dentist office and I sat down and I look over and there's neem mouthwash. The dentist recommended it. I now use it daily. It doesn't taste all that great, but uh, every toothpaste in India just about has neem in it. Neem extract. It's been used for thousands of years as a medicine. Uh, it is in the formulation that you see, like neem oil uh, here, it is 70% neem oil. Do not swallow this. Do not use it as a mouthwash. It's very concentrated. This stuff is a mouthwash down here. And that's a picture of the bottle that I use daily. Now, that's one thing. What does it tell me? It's not very harmful, but it's an oil. So if you coat insects with it, bees included, it will suffocate them. So you don't want to spray when there are bees actively out there. Maybe very early in the morning, uh, that would be probably the best time to, to spray. Because bees stay out pretty late this time of year. Uh, uh, overhead watering, this is uh, not what most people think. Uh, overhead watering in the morning reduces Mildew. Most people think uh, watering increases mildew, not according to the research, uh, but it does increase other fungal diseases. Uh, and this that I'm holding in my hand is a nutritional supplement that says potassium bicarbonate and US pharmaceutical and food grade. That's because if you're deficient in potassium, you can take a quarter teaspoon of this a day or something like that. Don't do it if you don't have the doctor's permission. However, it's also what you see research has shown can eradicate mildew. And there's a formulation that's actually got a little spreader in it that's frankly been hard to get during the uh, supply chain issues that I've been using for a few years called bicarb old fashioned fungicide, B I C A R B. This is sodium bicarbonate, very close relative of baking soda. Baking soda was always the home remedy for years to make mildew look better, but it didn't eradicate. The nice thing about potassium bicarbonate is two, twofold. One is it eradicates, the second is potassium is a major nutrient for roses and other plants. So what could be wrong with this other than the fact that it doesn't have a spreader in it or gardens? I don't know, but it's, it doesn't, with, without the spreader, it wouldn't even be harmful to bees, shouldn't be. It'll just be a, uh, yeah. The other things here are useful in uh, dormant sprays. It, it's a little harsh if you have it uh, during the growing season sometimes. And horticultural oil, and again, you don't want to use the oils and the, and the copper 
uh, excessively during the growing season, or you'll get this scrape your entire structure. Next slide. Mosaic virus. Uh, I used to be able to get good examples of this, but usually mosaic virus uh, looks like a lightning. And you can sort of see it on the, uh, the leaves here, there's yellow. And here on the leaves, there's yellow. It's not burned. And often it looks like uh, wavy or uh, lightning-like. And sometimes it's even symmetrical. Uh, what that does is it, it uh, reduces the, uh, the vigor of the plant. It does not kill the plant. How do you get it? People think, oh, I've got to sterilize my shears between each uh, cut. I grow orchids. You do need to sterilize orchid shears between each cut or else you'll move virus from one to the other. They're very common in orchids. Not so in the research that's been done on mosaic. It gets transmitted from one plant to another when the rootstock, that Dr. Huey or whatever, has virus and they bud it on. It does not come from cutting. Uh, the shears do not transmit. Uh, but the good news is it appears mostly in the early spring and the early flushes of growth. It doesn't tend to persist in the middle of summer so much. If, if it's there, it's, it's mild. The problem is it gives you weak plants. I've got a few in my garden that I like. I keep it, uh, even though they're uh, they look a little weird. Uh, you can prune it off if it's localized. UC Davis is now trying to get the growers to take their, uh, their stock, the root stock, that's been specially treated in a special temperature controlled environment for a period of time and it kills the virus. You can't do it in your oven at home without baking the thing. So it doesn't, it doesn't work to try and do it as the home. But uh, that's the way that they actually can we give you a clean new stock? Next slide. Probably the biggest thing I want to emphasize today is water. We talked a little bit about it. Uh, I know a friend of mine just got a $500 water bill. And she's got a small lot, but she keeps the lawn green for the dogs and she has you know, a number of roses and some other things. I don't think she quite realized what, what she had uh, been using as water. And she said, well, a couple look uh, dry, so I upped the percentage. But she did, I think, for a lot of the different things. If you can readjust so that the things that need water, where are they getting it, get the water. And things like lawns and roses really uh, help from doing it deeply and infrequently. There's one thing I can emphasize for the roses now in your yard, that's it. And the other that I would emphasize is mulch. We're going to go out afterward and look, and in my yard, and many other yards, and slowly here, uh, right now, you'll see that the mulch might have been scattered, blown away. There may be, you know, a half inch or so. The uh, master gardeners say three to five inches. That's a lot of mulch. Keep it away from the base of the plant. Three to five uh, inches of mulch does a lot of things for you. It reduces the amount of weeds. Uh, and if they do start, they're, in, they're loose, so they'll come right out. And uh, if you use what I would recommend too is uh, a wood type mulch, not a plastic or some of the other mulches you can buy in the stores, uh, you're eventually having that degrade and go into the soil and improve the soil life the aeration, the uh, reduction of evaporation and transpiration, and it helps aerate. Plus, if you walk on it in my yard right now, I, I did three applications of mulch between last year and this spring, three. And uh, it's spongy. And that says there's a lot of aeration. Proper soil has a mix of about 25% air, 25% water, and the rest mineral matter. Whereas typical urban soils, much less air, much less water, much more compaction. And if you had your lot scraped ever, and you've got a hard pan or anything else, 
you've got and you've had a mode and blow, uh, you've had a blower come through and take off all the stripped off all the leaves and all that other material what is that stuff it's uh, light colored it, there's no carbon in the soil there's no air and water in that soil and there's very little life in the soil and that uh, really all goes together and the mulch is key so we'll, we'll talk about that the one that they use out here the one i use is a, a barber mulch which is different sizes including some larger sizes not as pretty as the little redwood bark mulch which gets blown away it's it's not as as pretty as that but it really does a good job of interlocking and not blowing away in the wind or whatever uh, I, I it's hard to overemphasize mulch as a uh, technique to really help in, in this. Now, uh, we're getting to the end of this, but I, I want to uh, just emphasize the water again. There are several techniques for applying the water. Uh, the, I have combination. I have some, I have a lot of drippers. I have some weeping hose and I have uh, I have a little bit of sprinkling still left in the garden in a certain area. They all work. The problem with uh, any of them is you need to apply them properly, apply the water properly to not avoid, uh, to avoid excessive evaporation. And uh, so best time is a very, very early morning before it, it's, uh, the sun comes up. And then when the sun does come up, it dries off the leaves so that you're not going to be as much fungal disease. At the same time, you're uh, you're you're getting a, a good uh, soaking in before you get all the evaporation. So that's one thing. But that's overhead water. What about drip? Again, you can have drippers that are adjustable. I only use adjustable now. I used to have the kind that are have set amounts per each, and that works like a one gallon per hour works, but these adjustables can go from zero to 10 gallons per hour if you adjust them, they have little like sprinklers even. There are those types of, uh, uh, of, of drips. And you wanna have them uh, so that it covers the area around the drip line, maybe a couple of them in the area of the roads. You have to leave them on long enough so that if you dig down eight inches, you've got moisture down there, even a couple of days after you water. Uh, you're probably not going to dig down 12 or 15 or 20 inches, but that gives you some indication of how deep you can water. You can use a soil probe. They're helpful, but I find them uh, the cheap kind are not that accurate. If you do a core, you can probably get a better example of how moist it is, but those are hard to do some. Uh, okay, uh, I think we're getting near the end of the next slide. Ah, oh, yes. Um, now, fertilizer, uh, and I gave a whole class on this. If you're interested, I did one on growing roses organically. The Linkso garden uh, has, a, has it up on theirs now, uh, but it's uh, a little more extensive on what kind of fertilizers, how to use them. But if you use uh, chemical fertilizers, full, full uh, disclosure, as a uh, teen working my way through college, I worked on a farm, uh, family farm. I worked for a fertilizer company and I uh, helped water lawns and, and do gardening as the way to get through college. So, uh, it, I, I, you know, I, I, and I worked for a spray company too. So, full disclosure. Uh, but, Fertilizing with chemical fertilizers, it, well, and I'm a chemical engineer, uh, but using chemical fertilizers, when I say chemical, the kind of fast release, what happens? It's sort of some of them, like the foliar applied uh, sprays that you, you put on a, a hose and get the whole garden, sort of like having sugar in your diet. Yeah, you get some energy out of it, you get some growth out of it. But it doesn't really help the soil. It doesn't really help the organisms in there. And if you put it right, uh, strong fertilizer, you're right in the root zone, you can burn the roots. So, uh, 
Synthetic fertilizers are often applied monthly, March through September. You don't want to do it between September and about March. If you do it in October and November, you're causing new growth. And what you want to do is have the plant go dormant. You want to, uh, there's, I've got pruning videos if you're interested. But the organic fertilizers, they take heat, water, and bacteria normally to make the nutrients available to the plant. Uh, and so they it frees up the material. I use in my garden about 250 pounds of pellets that are meant for feeding cows and chickens and, and things like that, alfalfa pellets. Why? They're cheap. They actually provide a little mulch on top and, and improve the soil. Uh, they have uh, some nitrogen in them. They're cheaper per pound. It used to be about 50% of the pound. I think they've gone up to 75. But if you look at regular chemical fertilizers, they're much more expensive than that. Uh, good compost, oh, well, and alfalfa pellets also have something called tricontinol. It's a growth stimulant. It's natural. So I use a lot of alfalfa. I use it for tomatoes. I use it for uh, my fruit trees. I use it for uh, veggies. I use it for everything, but I use about 250 pounds, so almost a pound per rose in the garden for the year. Uh, good compost adds soil nutrients, but it also adds uh, micronutrients and uh, improves the soil health. And what I do personally is after pruning and things, and after each soil, uh, each uh, blooming cycle, I'll take and put compost around in a donut around the plant near in the drip zone and then cover that with mulch. And that works pretty well. The illustrations here are all organic except uh, this is a kelp seaweed. This is a sure start and it's a mixture of all sorts of goodies, uh, blood, bone meal, feather meal, uh, manures, uh, alfalfa, etc. Here are the alfalfa pellets, the little green pellets. When they get wet, they look like sick caterpillars, big sick caterpillars. Well, they do. Uh, and then there's compost. See how dark that is? That's saying there's a lot of carbon in it. And uh, those, that happens to be one of my favorites, which is a, a distal turkey compost. It's been well composted. Watch out for chicken manures that are fresh. They have a lot of ammonia, uh, ammoniacal nitrogen in them and they can easily burn the roots if you put it directly in. You can also make compost tea, uh, let it sit a little bit, get it smelly, but uh, it, uh, it's, it's great to add around the plants as well. Uh, so that's fertilization. Next slide. You really need to walk the garden. We're gonna do that afterwards here, but check the pruning needs, air, light, and ground clearance, ground clearance. Keep the leaves above the bottom. That's one of the things I'll point out here in a few roses. Again, they're in pretty good shape out there. Damage. I deem the damage if possible. Uh, you know, there's an example that I somebody had the other day uh, at my house. They said, oh, look at this. A perfect little circle, half circle. Uh, that's a leaf cutter bee. They don't hurt the rose. They'll uh, take a few leaves uh, and cut holes in them. Tends to be in the same plant. It's not a big deal. Uh, but you want to know what's what. There are some things that make lace out of them. There are leaf miners and uh, soft fly larvae or rose slugs that are not slugs. There are slugs and snails and all sorts of things. Identify the damage if you can. Um, the uh, the uh, suckers, you want to remove the ones below the ground levels, you wanna look for the damage. These are the things you wanna do when you're walking the garden, as well as pick any roses you want for the home. Oh, oh. Next. Here is a YouTube, uh, Peninsula Rose Society YouTube. If you search just that, Peninsula Rose Society YouTube, there's a whole series of things. There's also Peninsula Rose Society uh, and uh, those are two different things that uh, 
you can use to see some of the ideas and, and uh, information on how to take care of roses. Next slide. Peninsula Rose Society normally meets uh, the third Tuesday and uh, in the evenings, but we've late, lately been doing Zoom hybrids like this is uh, for the last few months. In person, we meet at the Veterans Memorial Senior Center in River City. If you have any questions afterward, you can email to my very secret email, stewdalton at gmail.com. No one would guess it's me, right? Uh, next. And there are references, which you probably don't want to try and copy. I will say, if you look up UC roses, pests, or diseases, or insects, any of those combinations of words, you'll find some of these references right at the top. Uh, and the American Rose Society is rose.org, not ars.org. Uh, and there's also a guide to uh, rose diseases and their management at the American Rose Society, but it's got this long, long HTML. Uh, you can look it up. And almost there. All right, here. I want to acknowledge and thank the San Mateo Arboretum Society, which I joined. Recently, they're a very nice organization. And Susan Carter is in the back room there. Uh, and uh, the UC San Mateo Francisco Master Gardeners, uh, who've been out here happily answering questions or right about now. And then uh, I'm, as I said, I'm, I did the uh, presentation, I'm a Master Rosarian, which only means I've been doing it a long time. Uh, they call them consulting resilience before you become a master resilience. And then past president of the Mr. Royal Society and current VP. And these are all my photographs, except where I noted a couple of the ones that uh, I didn't take. Now, I think it brings me to the when the master gardeners get back in, in person in different places, you will have one in that same. Uh, in that same Thursday, Veterans Memorial Senior Center location. It's a little room where you can bring in things. They have them in the Elkis Ranch and they have them in San Francisco. Unfortunately, so far, UC has not said you can come back in person. Otherwise, we would. And there are only things like this we do. Next. I think that is the last. Just to point out on these. When you prune a climber, point the tips down, you get more bloom. This is another climber. It's been in my yard 30 years now, and it uh, has done just fine up against the wall. And this theoretically is a climber, there we can, but it grows right as a shrub. And this is Pink Promise. That's the presentation. I'll be happy to answer any of the chat questions. And okay. we may have a few. And then also the questions that we have uh, from the audience. Okay, yeah, we do have a couple questions, Stu. Uh, one is on suckers. Uh, can they grow more like vines? Uh, yes, in fact, uh, uh, Dr. Huey is a climber and it's a rampant climber. It's a rampant spreader. It'll spread by the roots. And uh, I made the mistake of trying to get a start. I was thinking I was going to grab something. So I put it cutting. Oh, it started. And then it went through the bottom of the pot and into the ground. And now it's coming up. Oops. So, uh, it, you know, the, uh, they're, uh, they can be climbers, uh, especially Dr. Hugh. Okay. Uh, what is the name of the mildew supplement that you talked about? Potassium bicarbonate. Uh, the uh, trade name, I own no stock in the company or an Amazon for that matter. Uh, but the trade name is Bicarb, B I C A R B, old fashioned fungicide. Somebody said they found it on, uh, I don't know, eBay or someplace else at an exorbitant price while it was in a short supply. I have a couple of bottles of it still myself and I use it. It doesn't take much. 
Um, but this stuff, uh, the brand name is Pure, though I think several people sell it. It says sodium bicarbonate, it's just a chemical name. And it says USP pharmaceutical and food grade ingredients, pure potassium bicarbonate. So that's all it is. So if you mix this, probably not much, probably a quarter teaspoon for a quart of spray and a few drops of dish detergent or neem oil or something like that, it should work. But that potassium bicarbonate as the active ingredient, again, potassium is a nutrient. Any other? Uh, next question hold on, hold on. Uh, from Judith. Mm -hmm. oh. uh, next question from Judith. I have two hybrid tea bushes that have grown together and grown large. I would like to separate them. How and when do I do it? Uh, if you mean to uh, move one of them or both, uh, the best time is when they're dormant. Best time is uh, to find where you want to put them, prepare the holes and say, well, it's still dry or in early uh, fall. And then uh, when uh, you're ready to uh, dorm and prune, that's the perfect time to transfer. You can do it other times of year, but if you do it other times of year, the problem is you're cutting off a lot of the root. And if you cut off a lot of the root, you're, uh, you're, you're cutting off a lot of the water supply. You've got to prune them heavily, even at late in the year. And if you can get it out moist with some root ball, try that. You probably want to move one first. You may have to cut away a lot of the top growth in order to do it. Be careful because that's a great time to get stuck with a lot of thorns uh, uh, when you're trying to do that. But uh, you can, in effect, make it a book bare root plant. If you think about it, what they do in the field is that they take two or three year old plants, they rip them out of the ground, and they cut off all the top growth. And that's basically what you're going to do when you move them in the dormant season. I moved them up through May or so. I tend not to try and move them right now because it's too hot and dry. And I'm trying to save water. When you do plant them, make sure they stay moist, either with rain or with water. Are there any other on the? Uh, two? Well, one more. One more question from Lisa is asking: What is the easiest way to remove thorns? Uh, from your hand? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, uh, remove thorns. Uh, I don't tend to do it. There are strippers when you're doing arrangements that have uh, little holes in them and you can clamp them around and just sort of run it down. You can take uh, shears and cut them off. Uh, like this doesn't have any thorns. Oh yeah, this, this one little thorn. Uh, let me try this. Is that visible? Yep. Okay. Yes. And you just flip it flush. I, I'm flipping it this way because the, the sharp blade is right next to it. You get most of it. And so it won't stick you if that's what you're trying to do. That's also important if you ever do propagation. What I find one of my failed modes is if I don't take the thorns off, and I walk by and my clothing catches on, I pulled out the thing and uh, it's probably gonna die because I uh, pulled it out. Uh, but that's probably the easiest way. That it? Okay, that's all the questions. That's all the chat questions. Okay, we have an in-person, at least one. Hi, um, by, uh, for the bicarbon, no, fashion, what? Uh, bicarb, yeah. the first part of this, uh, word bicarb, B I C A R B, uh, and that that's the first word, and then it's old fashioned fungicide. So that's the full name of the stuff, Thank you. and it is an old fashioned. <laughs> morning or evening? Uh, it shouldn't matter. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't repeat the question. Uh, it was the stuff. The first question was the spelling of the of material that I was talking about, sodium bicarbonate. And the trade name of the one that is not as easy to find anymore. The second question was pruning. Is it better to do it morning or evening? The answer is either one, uh, even midday. Uh, but 
uh, you might find if you prune in the morning, uh, you can see anything that's that's uh, still out there and you might want to cut for the day. The best time to cut the flowers is in the, uh, in the early morning because they have the maximum moisture in them. Uh, but the, uh, and by the evening, say you had a really hot day, you may find some of the blooms are crisp. And so if you had a nice bloom, why not cut it then? And, and it, it's sort of more pleasant on a hot day to not do it in the heat of the day. Thank you. But that won't, I don't think it makes much difference on, the, uh, on anything else. And then uh, getting down at the bottom of the plant, I know that's not easy. Uh, for me, there is something that I use, which is, uh, since I have two knee replacements, I, uh, I, I kneel down and it has little handles coming up. There are all sorts of these things. They're very handy to get down and get those eight to 12 inches off the bottom, get down there and get in that area. Uh, yes, question in the back. I was curious where to get the sharpener. I haven't seen that. I'm guessing they're at Home Depot, but I just haven't come across one. The sharpeners, this one is, uh, there are two brands that I've got here with me. Maybe. And the one that I find most commonly is the Corona sharpener, and that's what it's called. I think the latest price was about 15 bucks on, uh, on Amazon. That's the red one here. It's a Corona. And this one's a Miller Falls. They're both identical in what they are. They're a piece of very hard silicon carbide material. You can sharpen any knife with this too. You just draw it over the, uh, the edge. I believe I've heard that the angle of the blade is something like 23 to 26 degrees, but you can't figure that out in the garden. I have a protractor here looking at it, but seriously, you just follow the edge I don't know if you can see the angle, you probably can't, but you follow the edge as closely as you can and you draw it across it a few times and just, uh... Now, this is one sharp blade. Scissors are two sharp blades. And this one, one sharp blade, but it, because I haven't sharpened it, I do have one that is sharp. Uh, I keep this one to show how it can crush. Uh, and if it, it's a flat blade, it's more likely to crush. My mother was a florist and she tells me, oh yeah, for these plants, you crush the stem, make them last longer. But you don't want to do that for a rose that's been cut. Other questions? Yes. You mentioned that uh, your preferred mulch is a different uh, combination two sides. What was the name of it again? And it's, uh, it, well, I, I got it at uh, Lingso. Terry Lingso is one of our master gardeners who's a great soil specialist. And she has a very good mulch called Premium Arbor Mulch. And I think many people have Arbor Mulch. Arbor, as in Arboretum or, you know, trees uh, or Arbor Day. And, and, uh, uh, it's, uh, premium Arbor Mulch is just a, uh, a a specific name for their mulch, but it has things that are maybe three inches long, half inch wide, and some that are almost, you know, a little bigger than sawdust and small chips. It makes a really nice combo and it tends to knit together uh, so that it doesn't blow away. Yeah, but it's in the rose garden. It's in the rose garden. It's in the rose garden too. We can see that. Yes, I know. It's what we use in the rose garden. Yep, yep. And yeah, we talked about that yesterday. I'll show it out there. Uh, another question. I also use the pellets that we're referring to. I get mine half a day at the beach shop. Yep. But I've never used them instead of just a fertilizer. Do you think there's enough nutrients in there? Uh, I use uh, other things as well, uh, especially in the early uh, March. Feeding. I use that uh, heavy duty compost. And I have, if you use compost and that, you don't need a lot of extra. There's something I didn't mention, I probably should. Uh, if you don't want the plants to uh, have a heavy bloom and you want to save as much water as you possibly can, you can do something sort of inducing summer dormancy by not watering this heavily, still watering deeply, and not fertilizing as much. 
Uh, and so uh, it may be good to reduce fertilizer in the middle of the heat, to re but it does reduce bloom. And then they come back in the fall. How do you recommend that the fertilizer be coming in water immediately? Well, uh, that's what I was talking about. Uh, uh, if you have, uh, it depends on if it's drippers, overhead sprinklers, weeping, there are, or netafilms, there are lots of different things. I'm actually setting up a master gardener specialist on irrigation uh, to give a talk uh, because it's so timely these days in August. But uh, some of the variable, uh, the ways you can measure a uh, sprinkler system in an area, take a bunch of things that are straight-sided cans, like tuna fish cans, tuna fish cans, put them, open them, get rid of the tuna fish. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, neighborhood cats would love you, <laughs> uh, but uh, you clean them out and uh, put them at different areas around the area of the sprinkle, see differences. Leave it on for a time interval, 10 minutes, whatever. See how much you get. This will give you the inches of water, and you can actually calculate that from the uh, to get the uh, gallons uh, and you can figure out. Uh, you don't have a system. Okay, then uh, like drippers. Drippers are usually color coded to the, the ones that are set amounts per drip. Uh, they're usually color coded. If you're hand watering, yeah. Okay, I didn't know. Hand Make a berm around the uh, plant uh, uh, at the drip line, a few inches high. Berm meaning like a little dike around the edge. Uh, fill it up once, then fill it up, wait, have it go down, fill it up again. And uh, if you're only doing it once or twice a week, that should be enough. If you think about how much is in there, five gallons per week per plant is usually enough for a regular plant. Really hot weather, you might have to do a little more. Other questions? Yes. Uh, well, because my uh, local uh, water district uh, allows me to, I can use two per week. Down in Southern California now, they're being limited to one. Uh, you need to really get real deep. <coughs> so I might split it between two different waters. So oh, uh, you want to try and get it deep. <coughs> the only way I know to is to dig down. <coughs> Talking too much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I'll wrap it up. So we're about at the witching hour. Okay. Okay. You're right. Uh, one thing uh, we use in the uh, rose garden, it's recommended by Terry Langso in March, we get an order of their garden, organic garden uh, compost, and Terry mixes a uh, rose and flower fertilizer in, and we put that in, usually I think the end of end of March or so and add it around all the all the roses, and that's worked real well for us. We've also used the diesel compost, but it's gotten very, very expensive. And for, you know, our our garden, we found that that this also works. And the rose and flower type uh, fertilizers are good fertilizers. I think Terry's is organic and it uh, uh, decomposes slow. Yes. So it, it's uh, yeah. spread out, it's not gonna burn. Yeah, so, Great program, Stu. Thank you. Another excellent presentation and uh, so much information on how we can have beautiful roses in this in these drought conditions. And as you mentioned, do check out the Peninsula Rose Societies. They have an excellent website with lots of resources, peninsularosesociety.org. And uh, in a few days, you will be emailed a link to a recording of the presentation and an evaluation form. Any unanswered questions can be addressed at that time. We will 
would pre appreciate feedback on what worked and where we can improve. Please join us for future seminars and workshops. The free Zoom seminar on Sunday, August 7th will be Sacred Space in the Garden with Master Garden Arete Nicholas. Nicholas. Sign up for the Zoom only program on our website, sanmateoarboretum.org slash classes dash events. The Master Gardeners have returned for their monthly plant clinic. Uh, they'll be here on August 7th between 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, they'll be available to answer your questions from general information to advice about specific problems. You can join the Arboretum Society and receive a discount on workshops at a variety of nurseries and local businesses on the peninsula and get a 10% discount on all purchases at the Arboretum's nursery. Also let us know if you're interested in volunteering by signing up on our website, or you can email us at info at sanmateoarboretum.org or call and leave a message at 650-579-0536. We have a variety of opportunities from working in the nursery or the rose garden to maintenance, community outreach, and much more. Again, thank you to Stu and to Kevin, our Zoom technical specialist, and to all of you for joining us today. The Zoom portion of this program is now finished. Thank you.